This is part two of the animal diversity lectures. We left off with um, discussing that animals are heterotrophs. Sorry, that means that they um, consume their food. They are not able to make their own food as um, autotrophs are, um, like plants. Animals um, may be carnivores, which means their um, food source is other animals. They may be herbivores, which means their food source is plants. A lot of our grazing animals are herbivores. A lot of our um, large, um, uh, what do you call them, predators, um, apex predators. <laughs> A lot of our predators, like um, you know, lions and tigers and uh, panthers. Um, all of those are uh, carnivores, sharks, that would be another example. Um, omnivores would be like us, humans. We eat a variety of meat and plant food sources. And um, this bear is an omnivore. Um, it is eating, uh, looks like a salmon maybe, I think, <laughs> um, or a trout. I don't really know, I'm sorry, I should know my fish, but Anyway, um, the, we know the bear is an omnivore because it also will eat plant material like berries. Um, and then we have a, uh, looks to be a parasite in the jar. And that is a very large parasite. And I honestly can't tell. Let's see if I blow it up. It looks like it might be, I don't know. Um, I'll look it up and tell you in the next, um, because it's in, the, it's in the study plan that I just can't look at it and tell what it is. It looks like something that has a sucker mouth, so it definitely looks like a parasite. Um, okay, so the body plans of animals are, uh, there's a great diversity in body plans. And the first thing we're going to discuss is symmetry. If, if something has symmetry, that means it has two equal halves. Well, a sponge, you can't divide a sponge and get two equal halves. Um, so we say that the sponge is asymmetrical, no symmetry. And um, it is the only phylum found in the parazoa. Remember, all animals are metazoa. And then the parazoa are the animals that do not have symmetry. Now we will um, go into the eumetazoa. And the eumetazoa were divided into um, the radiata and then the ones, that, the ones that have radial symmetry and the ones that had bilateral symmetry. So first we will look at the animals with radial symmetry. And what that means is you can cut you can make a cut in several different directions and get two equal halves. Um, you can cut horizontally, you can cut vertically, you can cut diagonally and get two equal halves through a jellyfish um, or a sea anemone. So the cnidaria include jellyfish, sea anemones. Um, the, the cnidaria also includes the coral. Seems like I'm leaving something out. But anyway, the phyla is Tenophora. The C is silent. The Tenophora, I'm sorry. Ugh. The Tenophora are the comb jellies. It tricked me because it was on the same page. Comb jellies are not the same as the um, true jellyfish. The Tenophora and the Cnidaria both have radial symmetry. The cnidaria includes the jellyfish and the sea anemones, and the coral are also cnidaria. Um, and the only the, the only difference is that the cnidaria have stinging cells and the tenophora do not. The animals with bilateral symmetry 
you can divide them into left and right halves. They normally have like a head region and a tail region. And like uh, this um, butterfly has two antenna. It's got two wings or at least two pair, um, maybe two pairs of wings. I'm not sure. It's hard to tell from the picture. But anyway, it's um, you can divide it into two equal halves um, only one way by drawing a line down its middle. So that's bilateral symmetry. Um, we humans have bilateral symmetry. That means the le they, we have a left and a right half. These are the planes that you can divide a human and an animal into, and it's it's good to show you the difference between um, a transverse plane in an upright animal like a human and a frontal plane in an animal that's um, got four legs. Um, <clears throat> so in a human, the mid-sagittal plane divides a human into left and right halves. So the mid-sagittal plane here would divide a human into left and right halves, um, and it would come right, right between the two nostrils, between the two eyes, would go, um, you know, right down the middle of the chin, the middle of the chest, and it would um, it would leave each half having one arm and one leg. The frontal plane in a human divides the human into a front and a back, a front and a back, or an anterior and posterior portion. So um, that is not sy symmetrical. So that's why we're bilateral. We're not radial. And then um, the transverse plane is like a cross section through the middle of, of the um, abdominal region. Okay, so when you look at a goat, which is on um, has all four legs on the you know on the ground, the frontal plane is going to be um, perpendicular to the one in the human. The frontal plane is going to divide the goat into a portion that has a head and a portion that has the legs. All four legs will be in one portion of the frontal plane whenever it's divided. The mid-sagittal plane is the same. It still goes right straight through the, the, the two eyes and um, each half would have two legs. The transverse plane, however, would be um, perpendicular to the transverse plane in the human. The cross section through the abdominal area would be vertical instead of horizontal. Now, body cavities in vertebrates, and humans are considered to be vertebrates, so we're not going to look at all body cavities, but um, having a body cavity, a body cavity is called a coelom, and all animals do not have a coelom. We have a dorsal cavity and a ventral cavity. Our dorsal cavity contains our brain and our spinal cord, the cranial cavity and the spinal cavity. Then our ventral cavity contains our chest or thoracic cavity, the diaphragm, which is a muscle that separates the thoracic and the abdominal cavities. And then the abdominopelvic cavity kind of fuses together as one large cavity that holds the um, organs, the reproductive organs and the, um, abdominal, or the um, abdominal organs like the liver and the, um, the stomach and the um, intestines. Now, there are limits on body size, although we do have animals that are huge, um, humongous, <laughs> but there are limits on body size. And a lot of what limits body size is when animals live on land, gravity limits their body size. They, um, they are being attracted to the earth and they have to um, have muscles and bones and some way to move their body. So um, they can only be as large as their muscles and their skeleton will allow them you know, to carry their body. And then in water, it's the drag. We've got some extremely large animals in the water, whales and um, sharks and um, even squid, but their body size is limited by um, 
how much they can drag in the water that they that they can actually pull along in the water so of course their body size can get extremely large but if they were to float up on the shore their, their the weight of their body would crush them they would not be able to breathe um, endoskeletons like humans have allow for a larger body size than exoskeletons like insects insects have exoskeletons um, crabs and lobsters have exoskeletons a snail has an exoskeleton uh, i don't know that that that's the shell i'm sorry it doesn't really count as an exoskeleton but endoskeleton would be um the the bones would be inside of the, the um tissues and one thing that helps solve this problem of body size and allows animals to get larger is this process of diffusion diffusion allows nutrients and oxygen and um waste materials to travel from cell to cell um, and it allows the animals to have to be multicellular and that is what allows animals to get large to get extremely large um, another limit on body size is the surface area to volume ratio in the supporting skeletons and heat dissipation so um Remember, we've learned about things that have um, that increase the surface area. Um, the smaller that the cell is, small cells have small cells have a larger surface area to volume ratio, and then large cells have a smaller. Large cells are opposite of this. They have a smaller surface area to volume ratio. So the small cells have more surface area, and so therefore they can absorb more nutrients. And it's the same thing with animals, but for different reasons. The larger the surface area compared to the volume, the faster that the animal can, um, can release heat from its body so it won't overheat. Um, bioenergetics. Um, has to do with whether or not the animal is warm-blooded or cold-blooded. Endotherms are like humans. They are warm-blooded. They're able to maintain a relatively constant body temperature. Ectotherms or ectothermic animals take on the temperature of their environment. They depend on their environment to heat their bodies. Um, the metabolic rate of an animal is the amount of energy expended by an animal over a specific time. That's a metabolic rate. These, this little creature here has a very, very fast metabolic rate, so it must eat um, continuously. Very, very fast metabolic rate. Smaller endothermic animals, like we just saw, have a greater surface area for their mass than larger ones. Therefore, they lose heat at a faster rate, and so they require more energy, and that's why they have to have a higher, faster metabolism. The more active an animal is, like birds, the more energy is needed to maintain that activity. So animals adapt to extremes of temperature or food availability through turper. Turper is a process that leads to a decrease in activity and metabolism and allows animals to survive in adverse conditions. Kind of like hibernating. I have a, um, a bearded dragon that uh, sometimes will, he, he'll go through periods of time that he doesn't really move or eat much. Um, it's not he's not really hibernating but he's just um he just goes through times when he slows down and a lot of reptiles do that complex tissues all right we talked about tissues that there were parazoa that have no tissues that's sponges and all the other animals are eumetazoa 